CEO Nick Maida. Yeah. Right. What's up, man? How you doing? Pretty good. How's it going? Good day so far. Good day so far. So. You guys having fun? Learning something? Awesome. Our rain dance worked. I think it's holding up. Yeah, I only yeah. felt a few drops. I think. I think so. It's going to be a fun party tonight. It is going to be a lot of fun. Super excited. Uh, but before we get too, uh, uh, you know, further down to the show here, we have a giveaway. We're going to give away some tickets. Awesome. So um, I, how many folks here have heard of Bottle Rock? Just making sure. Okay, cool. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. It's happening in Napa uh, in May, and we have two tickets uh, to give away. And so here's what we're going to do. Look under your seat. There should be... Wait, can, yeah. I, can I win? No, th th those are off, actually. No, these won't, there's nothing. It would be really weird if those were the ones oh. that won. Uh, there's a business card. Nothing. A business card. There you go. Congratulations, sir. Head of the Gainsight booth afterwards, and we'll, we'll get you taken care of. <laughs> that was fast, actually. Wow. Awesome. Um, and tomorrow we got a guitar to give away by Mr. Tom Petty, so uh, stick around. Great. Right. Awesome. Thank All you. Right, let's see, take it from here. See you soon. All right. Okay. Great. All right, so on to the content. So every year, uh, we love to hear from different voices about customer success. We love to hear from individuals, from leaders, from CCOs. But we also love to hear from CEOs about customer success and how it fits into their strategy. So I want to introduce a CEO I met recently, probably over the last year, I've been really impressed with. So Dennis from New Voice Media is going to come on stage in a second. Dennis actually came into New Voice Media uh, as the president of the company and then recently, just in January, got promoted to be CEO. But from the time he came in, he was very passionate about customer success. And as getting, uh, getting promoted recently, kind of is looking at it as a big lever of change in his company. So I was really excited to have him come on stage and talk about customer success at New Voice Media. So welcome, Dennis. Thank you. Hi. Hey. Hey. How you doing, man? Hey, I'm good, man. How are you? Awesome. All right. How's the CEO job treating you? Yes, you know, I get this tan from doing nothing. It's <laughs> great. Awesome. I got to get that job. That's good. I like it. No, it's so great to have you here. And honestly, Thank you. Thank the you. time we spent together, I can tell you're very passionate about all this. Um, it fits in the mission of your company, which we'll talk more about, mm. and also the way you're running your strategy, I believe. Yeah, totally. I mean, this is amazing. What a turnout. It's fantastic. I heard that you're considering a different career as well. So. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, I, I, my board fired me because of the rap thing. So yeah, I had to find a new career. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so really excited. As you know, we do bring our kind of childlike joy value at Gainsight uh, to everything we do. So just one quick warm-up question. Oh, God. What was your childhood dream when you were a kid? So when you were a little kid, what did you want to be? I'm going to be so boring. I was five years old when I broke the news to my dad that I wanted to be CEO. <laughs> so, um, I had people that wanted to be fireman, Spiderman, whatever, Batman, and I wanted to be a CEO. My dad uh, runs a restaurant and hotel business, and there's a, there's a picture of me sitting on this too high chair drinking espresso, five years old in Italy, <laughs> breaking the news to my dad that I was going to run my own thing. Uh, that was me at five years old. So you're living your childhood <laughs> dream. I'm living the dream. Awesome. Yeah. Well done, Des. Appreciate it. <laughs> Great job. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about your background. Cool. So before New Voice Media, give us the quick thumbnail of how you got to this point and kind of what attracted you to the job you're in now. Yeah, so the big secret is that I'm not from California. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a kind of thought I'd break it to you. But you're now moved here, I'm right? Moved, I'm now yeah. here. I'm in San Francisco. I've, I've been very fortunate. I've worked and lived in six different countries and uh, born and raised in Sardinia in Italy, a uh, product of an Italian father and a Dutch mother. And it kind of got me to move around the globe a little bit. And uh, very fortunate to have worked in large-scale companies like ADP and Barclays and eventually settled into software, uh, managing teams. I worked for a company called eGain here. I ran my own company as CEO uh, um, in, in the UK in a kind of uh, sentiment analysis and NLP space. And then eventually I ended up here at um, New Voice Media. Awesome, great. Well, we're going to talk about New Voice yeah. Media in a bit, but it seems to fit a lot with what we're talking about here at Gainsight, right? Uh, this, this, it's uh, f unbelievable, actually. I think when we're looking at uh, where we classically thought about the contact center. So New Voice Media is a company that uh, specializes in building cloud contact centers. And obviously, uh, what we have discovered through our conversations is what the synergies are between what you as a community have defined as customer success and actually the problems that are people are trying to solve when they're looking at contact centers. Uh, I think it's been really profound. 
That's amazing. And you guys have a vision for a contact center, which I think is very relevant for this audience because yeah. it's an analogy to customer success about the human side of it. Yeah, the old, so I mean, old school, if you think about contact centers, I mean, what do you guys think of when you're thinking of contact center? Do you get this really warm, fuzzy feeling? Uh, <laughs> So, and that's the problem. The problem of the industry is that you think of contact centers and go, oh my God, I can't believe I have to call them. Yeah. So what we've got is uh, the industry thinks and has been thinking for a long time that solving a contact center problem is about solving connectivity problems, telephony and making that work, work in the cloud. The issue is that that was true in the 90s, but today it's all about experience. And today what brands are really struggling with is not make the contact center work 24 seven. What they're struggling is, is where does the contact center fit in my digital experience. In other words, where do humans fit? Do I model them out of the equation? Or do I model them into the equation? How do I afford this? And the contact center industry, as you know, has always been around managing cost out of the cost to serve, is a beautifully, a beautifully constructed met average handle time, another dreadful metric. Um, so, you know, don't talk too long to customers and do it as cheap as possible. And then we get cross at the contact center why the experience is so bad. So deeply underinvest, buy crap technology and hope for the best. <laughs> so kind of we hope that by putting it at the heart of the customer experience, really at the center, with brands that want to uh, develop an experience and say, hey, we are here, we want to retain margin, we want to deliver something, we're competing on experience, that these brands think about the human impact. Uh, and this has been a really profound finding, which is when I also look at customer success, and this is where the whole thing came together for us, is that where when, when you do everything right with process, but you don't get the human element right, you're going to fail. Uh, you're gonna, people are going to renew based on cost. They're going to shop around and they're going to effectively say, hey, if your experience is nothing more than a prescriptive and a scripted experience, then guess what? It's a bit of like a utilitarian service and I'm going to value it that way. So there's no added value. So what we want to do is effectively bring and help the industry to figure out where the humans fit in all of this. That's awesome. Humans, we're talking about humans a lot today. It's a good, good, yeah. good topic. Well, you, you talk about customer experience in your, in your customers as a yeah. competitive differentiator. One of the things I was very impressed with, you came into New Voice Media and said, how could customer experience and customer success be a differentiator for you as well? Talk yeah. about that. Yeah, that's been really profound. So I started at New Voice Media first by working on clarifying the strategy and the go-to-market. Um, and wh what I've uh, done is effectively speaking to a lot of our customers. Well, that's where I went first. I then spoke to analysts and then forgot what they said and then went back to customers. <laughs> and um, what the customers were all saying was the same thing. They say, hey, we, the problem that we're trying to solve is a different problem. Uh, you're kind of boasting about your 5.9 availability. Oh, cool but this is what we what we're trying to solve is this and this is what they meant was is how do we compete how do we va how do we make the interaction accretive so instead of saying uh, it cost me $1.90 uh, how do you make it accretive so we came to the realization that actually Nuvos Media is on a mission to change the way contact centers work and therefore you can't do that alone on the product and how many here of you sit here as tech companies that probably maybe even working in the sales ecosystem and are trying to disrupt your, your industry. And actually what you see is that you can't do it on product alone. You have to deliver on your promise. And I see customer success as the vehicle where you operationalize your experience, where you effectively say, hey, we, we've given you a bunch of promises. We've said that we would do X, Y, and Z. We're transforming an industry and here's how we're going to help you. And I think customer success helps us to deliver that. So for me, it's very profound. It sits at the heart of how we orchestrated the experience at Nuvos Media. So you didn't just think of it as, hey, we need to reduce churn or whatever. It was something that was actually a strategy for the company. It's a strategy yeah. for the company, per absolutely. I mean, uh, reducing churn is uh, a really poor, reactive way yeah. of looking at the problem. Um, so for us, it's a strategy in a sense that you learn about product market fit. So because we're a global company, we've got about over 400 employees, uh, 750 customers. And we're growing pretty fast. So what happens is what churn tells you is where your, your, your fit is off. So what, I've, what, I, what I wanted to study is understand whether it was a product market fit, it was an expectation set, whether we've been a bit overzealous in the way we've set up the vision and not really delivered on the, through the sales cycle. And that's how we started to make changes through the company and really starting to look at rather than looking at your company as a funnel, we started to look as you, I think, would describe an hourglass or a bow tie model and expect as much from the back end of the funnel as we did at the front end of the funnel, if you like. I love that, because I feel like a lot of CS leaders undersell their strategic value by just talking about churn, right? They just go to their yeah. CEO and say, my job is 
avoiding churn, doing renewals, and you think about it totally no, different. No, I mean, your job is not that. Your job is to help us to find an even better product market fit. You know the product, you know where it works, where it doesn't work, what the friction points is. Your job is to help the whole of the company get better. Your job is not stemming churn. That's gone anyway. That discussion is gone. You're gonna, you're gonna, uh, the, the value is destroyed at that point. That's awesome. Yeah, so, so let's, uh, we'll use Slido. You can ask some questions about What's on your mind from a CEO perspective about customer success? And as they come up, I'll ask a few more. So, you, you know, New Voice Media has been around how long now? 15 years. 15 years. So yeah. you came into a company that already existed. Yeah. Obviously, you guys cared about your customers a lot already, even before you got there. How has the role of customer success and customer support and service evolved at New Voice Media before you got there and, and that where you're at now? Yeah, massive changes. Uh, one of the first thing we did is I found uh, a gentleman that's sitting over there, Chris Haggis who was a hidden gem in the organization and um, uh, immediately promoted him to SVP of our global customer success because he um, had been active in the field, really knew what our, uh, our customers were feeling and experiencing. And we went from a quite a reactive model, which you probably would have seen, which is uh, not paying for PS, <laughs> project <laughs> a little bit longer than you thought, or hey, is that really a support thing? What are we doing here? Very reactive to a model uh, with Chris's vision and supported by a kind of go-to-market vision that said, hey, we need to deliver um, on the promise that we are setting, which is we are making the interactions in a contact center accretive. So rather than saying this, contract, this interaction has cost me $2, how can you prove that, the, that you've actually added $15 to the lifetime value of a comp through that conversation? That is a game changer, and that's where a contact center becomes an investment center. So, uh, so you want your customer success team to be able to quantify we want to that yeah. economic impact yeah. to the customer. Which starts yeah. at the top, so it starts at the sale. So at the sale, you have to do, uh, uh, you have to set up the conversation in a way where you actually uh, have measurement and intent, mm -hmm. and you have to qualify that some of the organizations are actually able to kind of go on that journey and they're not just take, talking a good game. There's, uh, some customers don't really fit well with what we want to do here. Uh, it's a very traditional industry. Did you find when you came in that there were some customer segments that didn't make sense going forward? Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a, this is kind of, uh, this is what I mean when you start to take customer success really seriously and look at your product market vision. Not only, even uh, when you're looking at the global level, what is really interesting is maturity levels uh, in countries. So what we found is, for instance, to give you a bit of insight, is Australia, we thought, okay, it's a small market, do we really need to invest in that? And as we spent a lot of time there, we, we, we realized that most of the innovation at the context level is actually happening in Australia. We thought, why is that, how is that happening? And the reason for that is they're skipping, they skip, they've gone straight to cloud. So the companies were younger, they skipped a whole bunch of telephony, they went on cloud CRM, on cloud telephony. And they were able to drive kind of really innovative ways of personalization, kind of emotive connections with, with customers. So now all of a sudden, this small company, when you're looking at bookings, when you're looking at a really uh, singular lens, became really strategically important. So that's now become one of our investment areas to say, hey, how can we have customers that help us to shape the future roadmap, Horizon 3 thinking, um, by working closer with them on things that are kind of out there for, for maybe the UK or the US who are more conservative when they're looking at the context. So customer success can help find new markets in a way, help you figure out where you yeah. should double down. Yeah. And make it more real, whereas where you're going on it from a product market, from, from a product roadmap perspective, you get this typical kind of ivory tower thinking. Yeah. So by uh, Chris is uh, very heavily involved whenever we have a uh, product roadmap kind of discussion, and he fights for the strip of, hey, yeah, but my, the customers want this, so. And do you also identify areas you don't want to play based yeah. on that experience yeah. as well? Yeah, absolutely. There's sectors where we, uh, where effectively the conversation is we want to remove maybe a human aspect out of it, we want to go all digital, or it's all about driving cost out of the contact center. Actually, we want to do it in the cheapest way possible. We now actively qualify out. See, I think that's amazing what you're doing, because you're saying as a CEO, I'm going to focus my marketing, go-to-market efforts on areas where we're going to have strong customer success. Yeah. Not everyone does that. That's that's a well, and then the, the, but the, it's self-fulfilling, right? You think about what is the what is the mantra of marketing? The mantra of marketing is to drive advocacy. Well, you can't really drive advocacy if you're not delivering success. Yeah. Real advocacy is about measuring outcomes and amplifying the outcomes that you've realized. Um, and so it is, it's all connected. Um, it's all connected. And I think this is also the interesting thing that is that makes makes these industries kind of, as you're sitting here, you're kind of thinking, well, why is this relevant to me? I think the same thing is happening in the, in the customer success industry. Um, you know, a contact center that used to be cubicles, you know, this rows and rows, it's no longer like that. You know, if you're running a team of 15, 20 people, you're running a contact center. 
You have a co you've got the same situation. You're, you're having a remote conversation with customers where you're using multiple touch points, phone, email, chat, whatever interactions. And that's a contact center. So the whole definition is changing in the way we are using homework and what we traditionally call. So I think actually there's a lot of synergies between, and we can learn from implementing our own custom success, what Chris calls us drinking our own champagne. So Chris is kind of uh, forced on the organization to use new vice media ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, so you kind of feel all the glory and the pain <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and effectively be your own customer and effectively dr deliver that to our customers. And That's it's been insightful. Really That's insightful. awesome. So I'm going to go to some questions on Slido because these are great. So That's first question, which one. I think this might be something you've answered, but it'd be mm -hmm. interesting to go deeper on it. How do you measure as a CEO the ROI of the customer success program with your customer success leader being right here in the front? So you can yeah. answer it however you want. But how do you measure it quantitatively? It's a... Incredibly easy thing to do. <laughs> um, so a, pos a positive dollar retention rate. So effectively, what I want to see is I want to see a reduction in the gross retention, but I want to see a real uptick in the net retention. Um, so at the moment, we're tracking very positively. I'm targeting 130, uh, which is easily doable. Chris, isn't it? This is a safe environment. <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> we're setting uh, his so quotas so live <laughs> right here. Yeah, exactly. Pulse, pulse first. You guys can vote uh, on the quotas, <laughs> by the way, on the Slido. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and but but here's the thing. The thing is, um, uh, it's less about setting that up. It's more about orchestrating that conversation at the very top of the organization, so you don't get stuck on it. Because the reality is, the ROI of marketing is as tough as the ROI of customers. Uh, right. Exactly. So, and, and yet we don't really have r the difficult discussions about that. I talk so about what that you need time. to do yeah. in my mind is, and what I have done, which I thought is, uh, I didn't see myself pitching to the board why this was a good idea to spend money on. This year, we're spending more money in customer success and product than we're doing in sales and marketing. Wow, right. that's awesome. That's and a that's statement of commitment. Yeah. 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 So Some round of applause from the audience there. Yeah, and I'll tell you how I did it or how we did it. I'll tell you how we did it. Uh, there's two ways of doing it. You find yourself being the preacher and effectively say, oh, customer success is so important. We need to reduce churn because this is not a good way of growing, blah, blah, blah. And you cannot, that's one way of doing it. The other way is to change the context in which you're having the conversations with the most senior people in the company. And that's the route I went for. I'm a pretty shit advocate. So what I said <laughs> is, what I thought is, if I change the board pack, and the board pack effectively talks differently about the company, and the board pack is effectively, I got the board to agree, hey, would you say that the board pack is a reflection of how you run your company? Absolutely, Dennis. We want, absolutely, that's how we want the board pack to be great. And then what we done is, effectively, as an executive team, he says, what are the most important things for us? And then customer success became such a big priority that by that point, it forced the board conversation to talk about customer success as one of the four key priorities of the company. So it created a context where I didn't have that challenge so much, saying, yeah, but why are you spending three million there and not one million there? That is awesome. Yeah? So you did kind of inception to put the customer success in their minds, and then they're thinking about it now. Yeah, but not preaching. I see yeah. often that some people kind of go into flying the flag, oh my God, right. this is the most important thing in the world. And I kind of feel when you're talking to investors that really just want to see, let's face it, a lot of people just want to see bookings and churn. And, and it's a, they're both lagging indicators, a horrible thing. You can't run your company on it. But so there's a bit of education that needs to take place. And I think rather than preaching, I kind of feel that the education is probably more valuable. So this next question, I think, is it ties into the human side of this as CSM. So it says, it always seems like when renewals go well, sales takes credit. But when there is churn, it's success's fault. How many oh you feel God. that? How do you yeah. balance this as CEO? Right. I think there's like a round of applause going there, too. Um, but that's like a, it's a challenging thing. Like, how do you react? Let's talk about when something bad happens in New Voice Media, some customer churns, which everyone has one every now and then, right? How do you react and how do you send the right messages? Yeah, we don't. So I think this is a real, this is a great point, right? I think, so for me, churn is, uh, is an opportunity for, for to regroup. And I think the worst thing you can do is kind of go all um, emotional about it. Totally. Because um, um, this is not a failing of success. This is a failing at company level. But like, it's a whole chain of events. And the poor guys and girls that are working in success have tried their best and didn't work. It's just simply it ended there. But it could have ended in billing. It couldn't end in sales. So right. So uh, how do I balance that out is, well, again, I use the same framework when we talk about the company. So whenever we talk about uh, to the whole company, we have our quarterly updates, we talk about this as much as we talk sales. Whenever I send emails, 
I'm very cautious not to send company-wide emails celebrating sales or renewals and not celebrating something else whereby somebody has saved a customer in some way. They weren't off a renewal, but we had a real hot issue with them. And this guy at Go does this most incredible job. I'm, I'm very cautious that the signals that I send are about encouraging of doing some of the things that we know will lead to a successful outcome, but they're way earlier. Because some of you work in a leading and a leading indicator site, if you like, and not on the lagging indicator site that gets so much attention. So I just try to be consistent with my, uh, uh, with my endorsements and, and appraises. I love that. That's great. Well, so the next question is, I think, ties to this a little bit too, yeah. which is what sales is responsibility in this new world? You know, some companies, the sales team is just hunting and moving on. Yeah. Some companies are shared responsibility with CS. How do you think about that? Oh, well, here I'm brutal. So this, here I'm not so uh, subtle. Uh, I kind of feel sales' responsibility is to establish fit and to not sell anything. So in today's market where you effectively, your buyers are very educated. They're, and in our industry, they're buying a product, but they're buying a product for uh, a multiple number of years. You know, it's a m giant pain in the backside to rip out a contact center and put a new one in. And, and you don't want to fail these customers because they're highly operative environments. So what sales needs to do here is establish fit and do it in a way where we actually really learn from the customer. The moment here yeah, you're pitching, you're overselling, you're overstretching the truth, you're selling futures of the roadmap, you're in the wrong area. And I'm brutal about it. I, to give you an idea, we go as far as debooking things, taking, starting people on negative quotas. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, this is where problems start. So sales' responsibility is profound. And actually, sales' responsibility is the same responsibility as I have. When I go to a difficult customer conversation, I can't promise the earth to fix it because that's the same problem. So we all have the same standard. Well, this next question I think ties to another thing on people's minds, which is the relationship between CS and engineering yeah. and product management. There's so much kind of value and knowledge, um, but sometimes CS people don't feel heard by engineering and product management. Yeah. How do you think about that in your company? Yeah, so it's a really good point, and they talk slightly different languages as well. Um, so we, the way I do it is by we've got a, a committee where we discuss the product every month. And this is really about, okay, we had a roadmap, we had a plan this year, but what are the inputs from the field? So I try to get sales leadership on it. I've got sales engineering in there. I've got our, um, um, our, our kind of head of custom success. And we effectively take the inputs and say, where are the friction points here? Where are the opportunities? And that meeting or the fact that that happens gives kind of the backdrop for, hey, it's okay for us to have the conversations. So that's number one. Number two is we carve out time in a roadmap development for uh, success requests or customer requests. So we track it both at the case level and at the roadmap level. That's so there is, a, there is a, I guess, the environment for it to be heard. Excellent. Yeah. So um, well, I'll go to one of the ones at the bottom because it's a common question. Mm -hmm. you know, when you boil all of this down and you say, who owns the number? Who owns the accounts? You know, people always want to say, oh I own this customer. I don't really actually know what that means, but people yeah. say, I own that account, right? Or I own the number. How, what language do you use to talk about ownership inside New Voice Media? <sighs> I try to avoid it. <laughs> it's like such a horrible thing. Who I think owns? it's a dated concept. It's a really yeah. dated concept. Yeah. I think, listen, I think um, it, what I've done is, or what we've done is to effectively uh, starting to, to give people the same number. So one thing is we have all the executives are on uh, executive success plans. So they, they, they need to sponsor accounts. Two is Meaning they're meeting with them on yeah. a regular basis. Yeah, they've it's got like an yeah, obligation. Yeah. They need to check off uh, you know, a few meetings. They need to be physically present. They need to be part of the QBRs. Awesome. Right? So um, secondly is the metrics are very important. So for instance, and it starts with sales. So sales and marketing for us are, are both comped on bookings and pipeline. The same when I look at, kind of, uh, when I look at the product interface and customer success. We're actually looking at how, how we, this, there's a combination between is your product actually delivering the ability to be successful? There's an interlock there. We try to kind of interlock them there. So I try to avoid. But yes, we have, the way we've done it is we have client sales that's responsible for the relationship, uh, the overall relationship, which is really because we've got very complex accounts with, you know, we've got sometimes thousands of employees. And uh, so we want them to navigate the relationship and we've got customer success that is responsible for uh, value and adoption. So we effectively 
say, hey, your job is to drive value and adoption and helping we the, the whole company is at your disposal. At the sales level, your job is to have the right relationships and make sure that we have the right conversations with the right party because sometimes you can find yourself in a situation where you think you're being very successful, but if it's not being perceived as very receptive, mm -hmm. can, you can get into a very difficult situation. So that's how we try to separate them out. Excellent. Very thoughtful. I'm going to do the last one uh, for the audience, and I've got a couple more. This last one's just too fun not to answer, although I feel sorry for the person. This <laughs> my SaaS company invests in product and sales, but CS and support aren't receiving much investment. Is it time to move on or is oh, there still hope? Oh. We have to give live career advice to oh Anonymous uh, oh. and see what we sh Anonymous should oh do with their career. What do you think? Um, I would probably move on. <laughs> Anonymous, you can email us and we'll uh, help you find something new. I, I think so. I yeah. think, uh, and and I, let's, let's, be let's not be too um, uh, kind of balanced here. That's so outdated. Uh, you know, if you're running a SaaS company and that's how you're thinking about your business, yeah, I don't know. You're gonna be cra you're gonna be burning. I know liquidity markets are great and cash is cheap at the moment, but uh, that's not gonna last forever. So this is a really bad idea long term. So if you want long term, I would s look for something else. When you, uh, I'm gonna close out a couple questions. That I think tie back to well to what you do. So you know, Contact Center has a very historically very process orientation, not very human. Yeah. Customer success sometimes is very people oriented and not as process oriented. What do you think the right balance is long term of people and sort of like science? I think we figure that out. Okay, we're gonna figure that out. All right, we're gonna do that. So I th honestly, this is interesting. I say this coming over and over again. You guys have made the distinction between so a customer being happy is not the same as success, right? So that's what you talk about. In the context of the industry, it's the exact opposite. So when we talk about customer experience, we ended up, unfortunately, with a really fuzzy kind of definition. When we look at customer experience, we've broken it down to three things, and it's as simple as that. We think it's about goal. Have you achieved your goal? So which is uh, pretty simple, that you get what you were out to go. Secondly is effort. How much effort? How how easy or difficult was it? Then the other one is how did it make you feel? Now the issue that all of our customers have is that when you just do those first two well, goal and effort, you just survive. You exist. You're, you're okay. It's okay. The problem is that the goalpost is moving and it's effect what people are seeing is if you want to defend margin, you need to compete on experience. If that's where your USP is. If your USP is have got a unique product, but look at your client base, not many of them will have a unique product. Not many of them will discount on price, so they would want to value experience. So, and I think it's impossible to deliver a sustainable competitive advantage if you don't focus on delivering emotion. Emotion is not happiness. It's not happiness. It's establishing an emotive connection between the two organizations. And the difference between that is that here's the great thing for you guys, is emotive connections are between people, not companies. So here's where customer success, you can do an amazing job but having a disproportionate value impact if you get the basics right. So what I'm excited about is kind of figuring this out because I think we can learn a lot for customer success and folding that into the customer and the contact center thinking and the same way applying some of the customer contact center thinking back into because they're very good at, at kind of the process element of uh, how to manage large scale volumes of interactions. Well, I don't know about you, but for the audience, but for me, that sounds like human first. So that's pretty, pretty human amazing, first. Dennis, I like really that. thoughtful. I know everyone in the audience is thinking the same thing I am, which is I wish every CEO thought about customer success like you do, but I will tell you, yeah, a round of applause for that. And I will tell you five years from now, they all will. So right. thank you all so right, much, Dennis. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thanks thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks for joining us.